Good evening. Welcome to a year of courageous conversations in which together we explore how to foster greater inclusion and belonging in our community. I am Jessica Green, your co-host for the series, and along with Zena Jacques, Claire Nelson, and our Courageous Conversations team, we want to thank you for responding to the call and are honored that you are here. Welcome back to those of you who are returning, and a warm welcome to those who are joining us for the first time in the series. Since our first session in September, together we have defined courage, practiced mindfulness, and learned how to bypass the hard wiring of our brains in order to cultivate curiosity. All of these sessions have provided different ways of better understanding ourselves in order to better engage with one another. Despite our natural desires to want to jump in head first and get to the heavy stuff right away, throughout this process, we are all being asked to slow ourselves down. And as courageous fellow Lene Alves so beautifully describes in her recent blog post, we are learning to wade rather than dive into the awaiting waters of courageous conversation. Tonight's session, The Art of Listening, will complete this first semester in the series. It was placed here intentionally to be the bridge between the internal work that we have done together thus far and the more externally focused work that we will begin in January where we continue to explore topics touching on diversity and inclusion as a community. Should anyone wish to watch any of the previous sessions, you can find all of our resources, including videos of the sessions, online at CourageousConversations.us. Also online is the link to our, sur our survey. We're at the halfway point, but we always want to hear from you after every session. We would love to hear everything from how you thought this session went, what, what you're doing in your lives, um, because it's in your daily lives where all of these learnings are being put into place and practice. Please share with us your reflections, findings, stories, and questions if you are so inspired. So as you can see, we are videoing tonight, but be assured that your table conversations remain private, further honoring one another, and in an effort to create space for honest sharing, we ask that as individuals in the room share their stories, please treat the information as sacred and let it remain with you upon leaving. Thank you. Also, please silence your phones. Producing this series is a team effort, and we would be remiss not to acknowledge Barrington's White House, Barrington Area Library, Be Strong Together, Barrington Area Community Foundation, BMO, Harris Wealth Management, Sue and Rich Padula, Kim Duchesswa, and Urban Consulate for their partnership on this journey. Registration for the 2020 portion of the session is open on our website. We hope that you will come along for the entire journey, because it is an entire year of courageous conversations. So please register now, and if, there is, um, if it's full, put yourself on the wait list, and um, you know, people don't always show up, so there's chances that are good that you can get in. So whether you are already out there engaging in courageous conversations, or just beginning by having a courageous conversation with yourself, that's where most of us need to start. We applaud you for taking a chance and are walking alongside you in this journey. Thank you so much for being here. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome Drs. Nancy Burgoyne and Jacob Goldsmith from the Family Institute at Northwestern University. Dr. Burgoyne is the Chief Clinical Officer at the Family Institute, a licensed clinical psychologist, teacher, and a practicing family therapist for more than 30 years. Dr. Jacob Goldsmith is the Director of the Emerging Adults Program, faculty in the Marriage and Family Therapy Graduate Program at Northwestern, a researcher and practicing clinical psychologist with more than 15 years of experience. Nancy and Jacob are proud to be leaders in an organization that is celebrating its 50th year. The Family Institute at Northwestern University provides over 85,000 hours of scientifically informed clinical service annually to children, adolescents, couples, families, and individuals from all walks of life across the lifespan in four locations, Northbrook, Evanston, Chicago Loop, and Westchester. It also conducts leading edge research that informs clinical practice and the field of behavioral health. 
It offers world-class graduate programs in marriage and family therapy and counseling to well over 600 students on ground and online and offers a competitive postgraduate and postdoctoral training for up to a dozen highly qualified candidates a year. Okay, before we bring them on, I would love to introduce our convener in chief, as always, Dr. Reverend Zina Jacques, lead pastor of Barrington's Community Church and co host of the series, who will help us prepare for our practice tonight. Isn't just wonderful? <laughs> don't you just, don't you just, every month, every month. <laughs> We've come tonight to think together about active listening, to participate in it to wonder how we might expand and extend and even inspire our own active listening. And listening is so much more than attending to sound. If I said, I'm really glad to be here, you would have listened with your ears and with your eyes. You would have listened through your emotions and through your own memories. Listening involves every single part of us. And listening and hearing are different. To hear is to take in in an altogether different way. And hearing is at a high premium in our world just now. So thank you. Thank you for being here willing to use your time and talent and gifts to expand and extend and inspire different listening and deeper hearing. And we want to show you what can happen when this occurs. May I invite Stacy Douglas and Sue Griffith to come and, and, and be present here? Here's why I'm inviting them. They knew this was coming. We didn't surprise them. <laughs> You'll remember last month that Stacy, in part of her telling of her story, invited the whole room to approach her and to engage in courageous conversations. And in fact, Stacy and Sue have had a conversation. So let me ask just two or three questions because we want to have our, our presenters come. Stacy, what inspires you to try, what, what inspires you to dive into, to wade into these courageous conversations? Um, curiosity and a little bit from our last conversation, I was somewhat uncomfortable and upset by some information that was shared. And I just wanted to have open dialogue with anyone that was open to having a converse, conversation with me so we can clear up some biases and people can ask questions freely without being judged. Sue, what encouraged you to respond and reach out to Stacy? Um, I welcomed a chance to be with someone who's diverse from myself. Um, I raised my family in Oak Park for 20 some years and found when I came to Barrington that it was a lot less diverse. And so when Stacy and I sat together, we said, why don't we try to get together? Stacy, what comes out of, how many conversations did you, uh, were you invited to be part of? Um, currently I've had six conversations. Aha. Mm -hmm. As a result of courageous conversations. Yes. And over the weekend, I had maybe nine wow. conversations. What's come out of it for you? Um, my mother has always said there's, um, there's just one race, no human race. There's no black, white, Hispanic, any of that. It's one race. And I realize now that we're all just trying to figure out how to run the race. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, in the black church tradition, you would say, Amen. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm teaching you about diversity. I cut you off. Is there more? What? No, that's what, I, what I'm really taking from it, that mm -hmm. that's what it's about. So what has come out of this for you? Well, we, hit, we had a wonderful morning together. We um, talked about our families, our work, our things that, we were, that surprised us. She talked about having lived all over the world 
and how perhaps it was harder to be here living in the Midwest than it was down in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I talked about some of my experiences in Oak Park. And, uh, yeah. With those who are gathered, who are giving their time and energy this evening, what would you say to these assembled about being willing to wade into these conversations? How would you advise? Stacy and then, well, Sue first and then Stacy. Um, just do it, especially if you've been told. <laughs> especially if you've been told as you come up the elevator, now sit by someone you don't know. And then you're also invited to make a commitment to, to talk with someone that you hadn't spent much time with over this past month. So. Yeah. Just fortunately, it. she said yes, and she remembered me when I called her, so. <laughs> yes. Stacy, what would you advise? Well, uh, you will be presently surprised. This lady right here makes the best scones and homemade jam. So you get a little gift, you may or may not. <laughs> She's a good person to talk with, and I, I actually went to her home. And it was in Barrington, and I drove over to her home, and I was a little nervous, and I'm never nervous, but here I am, it's what, 9.30 in the morning, I'm an African-American woman, and I'm driving, approaching an older white woman's home. So I'm thinking, morning, some of her neighbors may think, why is this black woman going to her house? So I'm trying to look non-threatening, whatever that looks like. I'm like, hey, hey, you know, I'm waving at everyone. I'm friendly, you know, not here to murder anyone. But, and I shared that with her, yes. right? Uh -huh. But I just learned you need to take the leap mm -hmm. and have the conversation because you never know what's going to evolve as a result of that conversation. And we can't continue to tiptoe around one another because we are human. So if we continue to tiptoe around one another, we won't grow as a people. Would you say thank you? Oh. Thank you. Every act that changes the world starts with a single person, a single moment, a single step. If we're going to change the world, it starts with your single moment, your single action, your single step. Only question is, will you take it? Nancy and Jacob, we welcome you. Can you hear me? First things first, tiptoeing not allowed. We will, we will dive right in here. Let's make sure that this is working. Okay, all right. So way back in May, when you all got started uh, with Krista Tippett, how cool is that? That's cool, yeah. That's cool that she was here. Um, this fabulous core value became known to you as part of what was going to be a guiding light for this incredible endeavor that Jacob and I are incredibly proud uh, to be included in. Thank you so much. Um, little little backstory in this, and then I'll go back to this. I was here for the town warming last year, um, and my job was to talk, was to sit between some very fancy professor from UFC and, and another guy who happened to be an ambassador in the Obama administration, and I was wholly intimidated and, <laughs> and getting ready for my talk and all my papers, I always have all my papers. And then I sat down next to Reverend Jacques and I started to hear about what was coming to Barrington and that this was coming to Barrington. And I decided, yeah, I'm not gonna use my talk. I'm gonna talk about this. I'm gonna say a little bit about anxiety and a little bit about depression, but I'm gonna talk about this because this is extraordinary. And we're proud to be the bridge. I think that that is such an accurate thing to say that we're the bridge when you're moving from inner to interpersonal, from intra-psychic to interpersonal, you're talking about the realm of listening. And it starts here with generous listening as it's been defined by you. But we wanna zero in on a few things in here before we get started. To ready yourself for this, there are really three things that jumped out at Jacob and I when we were thinking about this. 
curiosity, which was covered last week. Jacob and I have had the advantage of hearing the prior presentations. They've been amazing. Our content is aligned. Um, so you'll recognize some of it. You'll recognize that it's building. It was really important for us to have continuity with our talk so that this would all make sense and fit together. So you can't, you, the, the best way to step into listening is the simple act of becoming curious, right? This is what we teach, we spend years teaching therapists. They say, what should I do? And you say, be curious. What should I say? And we say, be curious. They're like, really? And then they start to learn how hard that is to do. And the other thing is about showing up vulnerable. You wouldn't think that as the listener, you were being called to vulnerability. You would think it would be just the speaker that would be called to vulnerability. But if you're going to take someone in, you have to enter their frame of reference. And entering someone else's frame of reference is a challenge and an act of vulnerability because you have to let down your inner arguments. You have to let down your plan for what you're going to say. You have to move into their space and be there for a while. And the gift you get when you do that is you get the humanity behind the words. That's the gift that you get from that. So it certainly is that generous listening is an art and a virtue, but Jacob and I are going to approach it a little bit more from the scientific end um, because that's our skill set. People in professionals in behavioral health through our training and through our service spend years and years and years thinking about how to listen and how to show up for people. And so that's what we're going to take those skills and try to translate them uh, for your benefit tonight. I had a session on Monday um, that, made, that fit just beautifully into this. I had a couple that I saw 20 years ago in my practice. And um, they did some great work. They spent about a year with me. They did some great work. And then they went off and continued to raise their family and do good things. And they called me up again, and they came in. And they're now 75 years old. And they came into my office, and it was such an extraordinary experience. And they sat down. And I said, so what, what brings you back? Tell me what's going on. And they said, well, we'll tell you what brings us back. We don't remember a single thing you said. <laughs> nothing. We remember nothing. But we remember that you listened to us. And we need somebody to listen to us now. And so that's the gift. They may not remember. You know, that's the saying, right? They may not remember what you say. But how you were with them, that's what makes the difference. Now let us go forward. So why does it matter? There are three layers here nested in these observations. Listening is an antidote to alienation, and it's the road to self-awareness. That's the inner layer. That's the intra-psychic piece, right? That's the groundwork. When we think about listening, we typically think about listening to someone else. We can't get there well without first tuning into ourselves. That's the irony, is we first have to pause and take ourselves in in order to clear a path to be able to take someone else in. The gift that comes from that is connecting with ourselves frees us from this sense of alienation. So that good work of pausing and tuning in and listening to yourself, the gift of that is the freedom from alienation and self-awareness. On an interpersonal level, Listening facilitates connection, right? Facilitates connection. Human beings are wired to connect. Um, and if we are not uh, having a connected experience, loneliness and all kinds, there are all kinds of consequences as a result. Mental health consequences, certainly, but also practical consequences for folks. And then at the community level, I heard Dr. Reeves talk about fear and how our, our tribalism can manifest as fear. Um, and listening is a pathway to tolerance. And I'm listening to these community folks up here that were just talking about their experience with one another. 
um, and getting to know one another and enter one another's space, it's a pathway to tolerance. So this is why it matters. It takes us in all three levels. And we're going to break it down into three pieces for you. Three pieces that interact. We're going to talk about listening to ourselves. We're going to talk about listening to others. That's going to be our media part. Um, and then we're going to talk about listening to build community. So in each one of our segments, we'll be organized around this idea and how they influence each other. There's an interaction that takes place um, within and between these areas. And without one, it's very hard to get the other. OK? So we're going to start with a role play, us. We're going we're gonna to exploit our age difference. And also, we're going to exploit the fact that Jacob is the, the director of the Emerging Adult Program. And so, uh, and I have emerging adults in my family. Uh, so we're going to exploit what we think you, may think you may find to be a bit of a familiar scene, perhaps. So the idea is that um, I've come home from work. I'm doing a fairly, tr a fairly traditional thing here. I've come home from work. I'm going to make some dinner. What the heck for a change? I'm going to make some dinner. Typically, I don't make some dinner. This time, I'm going to make some dinner, so I'm feeling pretty proud of myself. And Jacob's coming home from work. And this is how he comes in, and this is how I respond. So this is my kitchen here, OK? So I'm cooking. Hey, Mom. Hey, babe. How are you? Dinner will be ready in about 15 minutes. 15, maybe nah, 20. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hungry. Yeah, just, yeah, it's fine. What do you mean you're not hungry? I just, it's Look, steak, Jacob. This is not a good day. I know you work very hard. That's, that, I get you work very hard. It was a long day. I can't do this right now. I'm just going to go. A long day in what way? It's the same stuff with my boss. I can't. Oh, I, the, the same stuff over and over and over the again. Boss. And, and but did you talk to him about that thing that we talked about last what are week? What even talking about? Last what, week. Hang on, hang on. You have no idea what happened today. None. You have Jacob, no idea what happened. We talked last time, and I gave you some suggestions about how to talk you to your boss. You have no idea what happened. Jacob. I have had lots of bosses. Okay, I boomer. am a boss. OK, Boomer. <laughs> Jacob, I'm just trying to help you. OK. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> Time out. OK. Be honest. Does anybody recognize? We'll do, we'll do mom first, and then we'll do son. Does anybody recognize themselves in that mom? Mm. I confess I do. I'm very talented at work in the listening department. Home, home is another matter. Let's think about this for a minute, though. Let's get serious. What do you think that she was feeling? Somebody, anybody, raise your hand. What do you think mom was feeling? Not appreciated. Not appreciated. What else? Frustrated. Frustrated. What else? Rejected. Rejected. Boy, you do relate. <laughs> worried. Yes, worried. OK. Dro we dropped down a layer. Nice. What else? Wants to fix it. Right. Wants to mm. fix it. What was she doing? Fixing. What was she doing? Fixing. She Talking, was fixing. Say it again. Talking, not listening. Talking, not listening. What else was she doing? Unasked for advice. Unasked for advice, everyone's favorite. <laughs> what else? Being a man. Yes, she was. Good for her. <laughs> she was problem solving, providing unasked for advice, and certainly not listening. She was mired in her own space and coming to her son from that place. And I don't think, to be fair, that the son was doing much better. And I will, I will be the first to own that I've been in that position myself. Let me ask the same question that Nancy did. 
what do you all think that I was feeling? Or, or what were you feeling when you've been in a similar situation? Misunderstood. Misunderstood. Frustrated. Frustrated. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Condescended to. Condescended to. Dismissed. Not heard. Not heard. On the defensive. On the defensive. On the defensive, I think, is really key. I, and I, I know I do this at home, almost immediately did what a lot of people do when they feel condescended to, not heard, defensive, which is I just stopped communicating. There's a point there at which we stop having a conversation, and it happens really early on. So listening can't happen when the speaker moves out of communication and into sort of passive aggressive management. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing there was just managing her, yes. not talking to her. Mm -hmm. And when you get to that place, you're 10 steps away from good communication and good listening. To get back from there, you have to repair. So we can't jump from where we just were into any sort of good listening. So we want to show you what an attempt at repair might look like? An attempt. It's an attempt. OK. OK, 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 Jacob, just a minute, just a minute, OK. Just a minute, OK. OK, OK. All right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was all in this and not in this. Can we take a stab at this at dinner? You know, actually, I'm really hungry. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I actually, I don't know that I really want to talk about this. But if you're making steak, I'll show up. <laughs> and, and yeah, so like 50-50 that we can actually talk about this. But let me just change and I'll come down for dinner. I'll take 50-50. 50-50 is good enough. Yeah, thanks. What did, what did they do? A door's been opened. A door's been opened. Why did I take off my shoes? Yes, I did. I literally was grounding myself. Also, heels, right? I don't know. Can I be where I need to be? I don't know. Put it on a more equal footing. Put it on a more equal footing, right? Even just internally. Get myself in a space where I can show up for somebody. It wasn't great. It wasn't great. It was a start, right? What did Jacob do? Yeah, I, I want to say, and, and this resonates for me, and also is something that comes up over and over and over with folks who I work with clinically, that expectations really matter. I would call that a really good outcome if a client came in and said, this is how I repaired things with my mom, and oh, I really wanted it to be better. You know, it's like, then what were you expecting? So I think having realistic expectations, this is a really good start. And to get back and make the repair successful, both people have to be on board with taking that good start and running with it as opposed to expecting something perfect. We want to manage our expectations. <coughs> so let's have you guys do something here. We believe in practice. Listening takes a lot of practice. Um, and it takes a lot more practice at home um, than elsewhere, of course. Um, but let's try to do a little bit of that practice here. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to exploit something that you've already learned that is such a good fit. You may have not have been here, and that's OK. I'm going to walk you through it. Um, it was such a useful thing that Dr. Robinson Lyles did when she had folks settle in, ground themselves, tune into their breath, right? It was a mindfulness exercise that you can use in a shorter form to ground yourself around this listening to ourselves. So for mom to come back and do anything 
she needed to tune into herself. So I'm gonna walk you through just a little bit of an exercise and then we'll make use of some of the pieces of paper that are on your, on your table. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to put both feet on the floor and I'd like you to enter your own space, your own psychological, emotional, physical space. Some people like to close their eyes. You can, you can use a soft gaze. There's no, there's no rule about that. What I think was really useful that Dr. Lyles did, and I would encourage you to try this, is put a hand on your belly. And now put a hand on your heart. And just follow your breath. Don't change it. Don't modify it. Just pay attention to how it moves through you. Start to notice what you're hearing from yourself. What are you saying to yourself? What are you feeling? Watch the thoughts come, watch them go. You don't have to catch them, you don't have to analyze them, you don't have to wrestle them to the ground, you just have to notice them and practice releasing them. Now you just watch Jacob and I do a little role play. And I'd like to ask you a question that I'd like you to answer first silently to yourself. With whom do you need to repair? With whom do you need to repair? Notice what comes up for you. Notice if your breathing changes, the thoughts and the feelings that come up. Just notice. That's where change starts, is by noticing. And when you're ready, I'd like you to come back and in front of you on your table is a piece of paper. <coughs> and it provides a space for you to write privately if you choose to, not at all if you don't want to. With whom do you need to repair? And underneath that, what do you say to yourself? And what do you feel? when you think about the person or persons with whom you need to repair. Take a few minutes to enter that. I wanted you to take a minute to enter into that because our thought was entering into something that really mattered to you then you would be thinking about that as we went through our conversation tonight. And it would have greater relevance for you, perhaps. You might imagine yourself trying to apply this to this poignant experience that we all have of needing to repair with folks. So maybe at the end of the uh, talk tonight, you'll, you'll want to fill in that last piece. That's up to you. But let's talk about this a little bit. First, we had you tune in, right? To prepare to listen, you have to first tune in to yourself. What are you saying to yourself? What are you feeling? Typically, we have a lot of feelings that tumble out onto one another 
We don't just have one feeling and have it stop there, or one thought and then have it stop there. None of us are monolithic inside, and so we have many thoughts and feelings that tumble out, and they often tumble out in conflict. So it's important for us to take a moment, that extraordinarily important pause that's been being talked about in these many conversations that you're having, and tune in to ourselves. Oops. Part of what I wanted to want to say about uh, a repair, actually maybe I'll go back and say this one thing and then, and then I'll advance. The trade-off of notes, it reminds me of things I forgot. Is that when we go to repair, it's very hard, and I don't know if you notice this when you, when, the, when you said, with whom do I need to repair, and you started to think about that. It may be that you also thought about whatever the injury was that you experienced. Because it's unlikely that you need to repair with someone where the injury hasn't been mutual. It's very unlikely, right? And it is actually true that everyone's behavior is precipitated by something before it. Our behaviors unfold in sequences. They unfold in patterns, right? And they seem to go around and around in highly familiar ways. And our argument always is, I wouldn't have done what I did if you didn't first do what you did. And they'd say, yeah, but I wouldn't have done that if you hadn't done that. And they're like, yeah, but I did that because you always do this. Long as I've known you and I knew it was coming, and so I did that, right? And you could track it back. When I work with couples, I say, we could track this back with infinite regress to the day that you met. <laughs> I did that because you did that because you did that, and it, that's just how it goes. Right? We can't make change tracking that sequence back like that. We have to pick our arc of the sequence and be accountable for that. We have to pick our arc of the sequence and be accountable for that. And here's the good news. You have the most degrees of freedom to control your own behavior, to control how you show up. That's where you have the most degrees of freedom. So it's worth it, right? To drop the rope and step into being accountable for your part of the repair without telling the story of because you, because you, because you, because you, because you. Okay? It's not easy to do. It's not easy to do at all. So how do you do it? You stick in that pause. You stick in that pregnant pause. Because in a sequence, <clears throat> in a sequence, if there's not a stop, it's going to tumble out in its usual way. So you take off your shoes, or you put your hand on your belly, or you put your feet fat on the floor, or you go to the bathroom, and you take a minute to pause and to be where you are with your own thoughts. What am I saying to myself? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? Now, feelings are tricky. And this is a tricky thing to address as a psychologist, where many people feel like feelings are the most important thing. Um, I don't think so. I th think feelings are an important thing, an extremely important thing. They're messages from you about you, and they require attending just like they require attending from somebody else. But they're often not a good compass. They're often not a good compass. Use your feelings as one piece of information to help you decide what you're going to do next. But I would encourage you to organize yourself around your values, because those can march you towards the point on the horizon you want to go, and feelings sometimes can be, if you used a, a sailing metaphor, and you're trying to get somewhere on, 
on the ocean, the feelings can be a lot of weather, a lot of weather. And you have to adjust to the weather. You have to accommodate the weather. You have to pay attention to the weather. It's vitally important that you do. It's not something to pass off. But it's not going to necessarily get you where you want to go. So when we're tuning into ourselves here, it's not the, the stir of feelings up here. It's a little bit heresy from a therapist, but there you have it. There you have it. OK. All right, I'm going to turn it over to my friend Jacob. Thanks, Nancy. I, thinking about what you were saying about feelings, the, the metaphor that I will sometimes use with clients um, is if you're wanting to, let's say, train for a race, you're wanting to get into shape, you start running, you start biking, you will realize inherently that sometimes you will feel unpleasant physical sensations. And if you want to do this for any period of time without injuring yourself, you have to get really good at telling the difference between pain that you can work through and pain that you can't work through. Yeah. Because sometimes it's just tension and you notice it and you work through it. And other times it means you need to stop. And so I, maybe it's heresy from me as well, but I'm with you that you do not need to be dominated by your feelings. That's not what we're asking you to do. So let's talk about listening to others, assuming that you've done the work to listen to yourself. I wanna talk about three different examples to start. One, you're in a math class and it's hard and there's gonna be a test. Two, you're at work and a colleague comes to you and says, I've got this problem related to our work and I need your help figuring it out. Three, you're a parent your kid comes to you after months of sulking around the house and says, okay, dad, mom, I'm ready to talk to you about what's going on and I, I, I think maybe you can help me. Three times when you really need to be a good listener, but three, I would say, completely different modes of listening. So in the math class, you're listening to absorb and memorize facts. And I think when you look at, and I sort of Google searched listening techniques as we were preparing this to see what else is out there, right? Because I know how we're trained as therapists. What you get are a lot of really good techniques for absorbing facts, which, are, which is great, right? You need to be able to do that to function in the world. It's part of being a good listener. In the second example, a work problem, you're still mostly absorbing facts, and you're doing so in your frame of reference. You're thinking, what does what my colleague is saying mean to me so that I can use my brain to come up to a, with a solution, right? So you're absorbing, you're thinking maybe a little bit about the context below the facts and the subtext there, but it's still in your frame of reference. Now, how many people, when I say your kid comes to you after months of sulking, feel like it's basically the same kind of listening as your coworker comes to you with a problem? So I, and I think intellectually we all understand this, right? And yet, I think when people in our lives come to us in crisis, we often default to that second kind of listening instead of going deeper. The hallmark of that deeper listening is that you step into the frame of reference of the other. And what I mean by that is that fundamentally you're asking, what does this information mean to you? Not what does this information mean to me? What does this information mean to you, not what does this information mean to me? By the way, if you can do that, you're gonna remember the facts better. So shooting for that deeper listening doesn't actually hurt you when it comes to getting information. And frankly, when people feel understood, they're gonna give you better information anyway. So really, regardless of which of those three you're shooting for, it's essentially the same skill set for deep listening. And that kind of listening, that generous listening, is in essence listening to connect. Listening actually facilitates connection, um, both in a messy, poetic, subjective way and in a very cold, objective, scientific way. I, if I say feeling felt, do you all know what I mean? Um, when someone really gets you, that resonates in your body. Well. There are neurological reasons for that. Um, I think it would be fair to say we are wired for connection. 
However, I want to say that with a caveat. When I say that we're wired for connection, I worry that that makes it sound like connection through deep listening is effortless. And it's not. Because I could say we're wired neurologically to swing a bat and hit a baseball. We are. We're neuromuscularly, like we're well set up to do it. But it's really hard. So yes, in fact, neurologically, we are wired to connect. This is not just a poetic notion. But in practice, you're going to have to go through the steps that we're going to lay out multiple times to build a repertoire of skills so that you can use that neurological apparatus the way that it was designed. Right? So I, I don't want to essentially gaslight people into feeling like this should be effortless just because there's neurology behind it. OK, so skills. Good listening requires skillful work by the speaker and the listener. We were called to talk about listening, but I need to at least briefly review the speaker set of skills. Because if the speaker isn't practicing good skills, look, you can be the best listener in the world. And if someone is just coming in to steamroll you, no amount of skillfulness in your part is going to overcome that. And you should not feel bad about it. So here are the skills for the speaker. Um, you will be more impactful if you use I statements. Uh, this is what, what I think a lot of therapists call power language. I see and I feel. The minute I say to you, you made me feel a certain way, all you need to say to me is, no, I didn't, and the conversation is over. However, when I say, when you did this, I felt that, it's extremely hard to argue with. Talk about what you see and what you feel. That said, say less. Right? You are going to be more impactful if you prepare and think through what it is that you want to say. John Gottman, who's a preeminent marital therapy researcher, talks about the soft startup. So his findings show that couples who fight a lot but fight well stay together for just as long as couples that don't fight a lot and actually stay together a lot longer than couples that fight poorly. Soft startup means you don't start at a 10 out of 10. You pick a safe entry point, much like this series of talks is building up towards what's coming in 2020, that's an example of a soft startup. You don't have to dive into the hardest material. Share the floor, I think that's fairly straightforward. Um, even if you're the speaker, you need to be prepared to do some listening. And finally, no kitchen sinking. No always, no never. Pick one topic and one instance, and you are much more likely to be heard. Now the skills for the listener. Pause. Now, well, this is going to come up a lot. Pause. Pause, relax, get yourself open. I see probably 20 clients a week, 25 clients a week. Walking into every session, I do a quick body scan to see how I'm feeling. Because otherwise, what's going on for me is going to get in the way of me hearing what someone is going to say. Um, in in the 12 step program, they talk about halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. You're not going to be very effective at doing difficult things when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired. So part of the pause is just a self assessment. Next, you got to pay attention. What are you paying attention to? I think you need to be very careful about what you choose to pay attention to. You can pay attention to facts. You can pay attention to details and peripheral information. Or you can pay attention to the meaning, the context, and the emotion, which lives not just in the words, but in the subtext and the posture and all the other information that's coming your way. And you have a choice. You can focus on yourself. So if in your frame of reference you're asking, what does this mean to me? Or you can focus on the other. That's the other frame of reference. What does this mean to the person who I'm talking to, to the person who I'm listening to? Don't mind read. Um, when you say to someone, well, I think what's going on is you're speaking from your frame of reference about someone else's psychological experience. And even if you're right, that doesn't help someone feel heard. So if you have questions, ask questions. But don't mind read. 
do respond, and we're saying respond as opposed to react. When we talk about response, we're talking about thoughtful, planful, mindful response as opposed to acting instinctively out of emotion. Finally, and I think this is probably the biggest core listening point, and it actually has to do with what you do when you're done listening. The first thing out of your mouth when you're done listening should be some sort of response about what the other person has said. Not your feelings about it, not your thoughts about it, not what you want to do about it. You're checking out, did I hear you right? I heard you say, or is it true that you mean? And with that kind of response, literally we call this speaker-listener technique in marital therapy. That creates empathy and creates connection. And actually, I mean, frankly, is important just because much of the time, even as therapists, we get it wrong. I can't tell you how many times I've said, completely sure of myself. So what you mean is, <laughs> and I'm repeating back basically the same words the client says. The person says, no, that's, that's not what I meant at all. OK, go back. What did I miss? I don't know if these six skills feel easy. I think in practice, they can be fairly straightforward. If you're talking about innocuous topics, you can knock through these pretty quickly. right? Where this gets complicated is that most of the time, we're not practicing talking about innocuous topics. We're talking about real things that are fraught and emotional. Yes, indeed, we sure are. So what do you do? How do you listen when it's hard? Let's back up. What makes it hard? When it's hard to listen, what's going on? Anybody? Say it again. It's emotional. You're feeling triggered. You're feeling a lot. And our brains get a little scrambled, right? Vested interest in a specific outcome. Indeed. A, a vested interest in a specific outcome. We're listening with a goal, and it's our goal, right? It's like if I listen to you, maybe if I listen to you for a little while, then I'll get to say what I need to say, OK? Yeah. What else could make it hard? Fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. Thank you for saying that. That is a, a profound and ever-present reality when we're engaging with someone interpersonally, right? And most of us have had enough in our life of hurt in that department that if we felt rejected or abandoned or lost or left or any one of those things or rejected, um, then when we're in a listening space where we've showed up to be curious and vulnerable, we've put a lot on the line. We've put a lot on the line. So what contributes? What do you do about it? What helps, right? What do you, what do, you do when it's hard? You start in the same place all the time, which is with noticing. Um, that's my, my, my starting point for therapy for the last 15 years. For the first 15, I used to start with homework. <laughs> for the last 15, I start with just notice. I want you to go home, and I want you to notice. Notice what happens when. Notice what you say to yourself when. Pay attention to. Start to tune in. Start to notice. Our context is part of what makes it hard, right? There's reality to that. If you are the mom and she is making dinner and she's been on her feet in her three inch heels for eight hours and she's tired and she's all proud of herself because she brought a steak for her son but he comes in like not hungry, that's a context. That's not a context that sets us up for success. Right? So the context does matter. It's not irrelevant. And if you know the context isn't a good fit for you, then uh, in order to show up as a listener, then pausing and revising your context is important. Our wiring, right? Um, Dr. Robinson talked about this quite a bit, and Dr. Reeves, right? That we have, we are wired when we're under stress, things are emotional for this fight, flight, freeze. I'm not going to review all of that because it's been <coughs> reviewed before and I think it's 
fairly well known in the literature, but I think it's worth you asking yourself, how do you characteristically show up when your nervous system is set alight? I'm a freezer. I just freeze, right? And there are good reasons for that. But everybody has their own typical response. And when you notice yourself move into that space, that should be a little bit of an alarm bell for you. Our fears, right? Our deepest fears, rejection, all those that we just mentioned, right? And we also talked about how fear of difference when, when your prior presenters were talking and they were talking about fear, they talked about how evolution has contributed to that. And so we, we are wired to not feel automatically safe when we enter a, a situation where there's difference. So we have to be intentional about moving through that. Our history. So let's think about this mom for a minute that was in the role play, and let's think about her a little bit more deeply, okay? So yeah, she was tired. So yeah, if she was at the end of a long day, that was the context. So she's a fighter in the middle of, context, in the middle of conflict. She's a fighter, so all that unfolded. What else could be true about mom if we're thinking about her fears and her history? She's interacting with her son. He's a young adult. He's in a job. He, it's not going well with his boss. What else could be going on for her? She's still in parenting mode. She's in parenting mode, right? We often say that parents of young adults need to make a transition from a manager to a consultant. Right, to sort of step out of management mode and say, do you want my advice? It could really be one of two things vis-a-vis -vis the boss, right? It could be that I've messed up with the boss and now I'm seeing my son show up in a familiar way and I'm activated and I'm gonna fix that, right? I do a lot better to own it, but instead I'm gonna fix it, right? Or it could be that I'm worried about him, right? that he's X age and doesn't look like he's launching anytime soon and it's not going well and I'm, I'm just flat out worried about him. But deeper than that, if he doesn't do a good job, does it mean that I didn't do a good job? Do I need him to show up in a certain way so I can feel okay about myself? Who's really, who's really struggling here? If I let him be who he is, what does that mean about me, right? So as parents, and, and certainly as people in the lives of people that we love, how they show up matters because it has a lot to do with how I show up. Let's take it one step deeper. I wonder how this mom launched. I wonder if, like me, she was the kid who needed to be out at 18. You're out at 18, you're done, bye-bye. And so him home still at 28 with a boss problem? <laughs> it doesn't feel fair. The part of me that felt deprived and turned out too soon is gonna be activated by this, right? And maybe the flip side of that is I'm gonna be protecting him from it. So he, maybe he's getting mixed messages from me. Stay close, get out, do this, don't do that. So when you go all the way down what makes listening hard, it digs down into our stuff. It digs down into our stuff. What else makes it hard? Our assumptions and our expectations. Jacob addressed this well. He said that we think it should be easy if we have the skills and because we're wired to connect, but it isn't, right? So we approach things passively instead of being intentional about moving into listening. And also because we think we already know, right? When Jacob walked in, I said, oh, it's the thing with your boss again. You know they've had this conversation a bunch of times. Jacob doesn't care about the content. That's not why he's sharing. 
He's sharing because he had a painful experience and now he wants to feel felt. He wants to feel connected to somebody after a day of feeling disconnected. He wants a soft place to fall. He doesn't want to be fixed, right? And so me thinking that I already know the boss story is irrelevant. I might know the boss story, but that's not what he's coming to me for, right? So once you realize you don't know, you pay attention. And we don't know what's on the other end of what somebody needs from us at the moment when we're attending to the content and making assumptions from that place. So what helps? What helps when listening's hard? I'm not gonna leave you hanging out there to dry. <laughs> appreciating what's at stake. And what's at stake is the quality of your relationships, right? It may not be your relationships, it may be your relationships themselves, but it's the quality of your relationships with yourself and with others. I encourage you to prepare. When you have an important conversation to have, think about this, translate this to a work context. You would never convene a meeting that was important and not let the other people that are coming to the meeting know what's on the agenda. That would be a, a, a lousy way to conduct business, right? That would be, nobody would want to show you, they would show up worried and, and not ready, right? So setting an agenda. Let's, let's try to talk about it at dinner. 50-50, we don't know how it's gonna go. Let's try to talk about it at dinner. It's not formal. You don't have to send a memo, right? But set an agenda. Making the time and the space, right? And doing the self-work, Jacob talked about a trick that all therapists use. They sort of, we see people in the hall before they open the waiting room door, take a breath, ground themselves, where am I? What's going on with me? You have to do the self-work before you enter the space. I also, my personal favorite is sometimes I need to choose another venue. This past weekend, I took a hike with, with my young adult kid. And when we were walking this way, it was a lot easier to talk than when we were facing this way. Every parent of a teen knows this. When you're driving in the car, magically they talk. <laughs> they talk. And if you're in listening mode, you can exploit that. It's less threatening <laughs> than face to face. It's less threatening than face to face. But we can blow it, right, if we don't take advantage of those opportunities, right? So there are some things we can do to prepare ourselves to set it up so that we do it well. What also helps when it's hard is using skills. We're harping on this all important pause. You've heard this in two other talks and ours. You're like, got it, the pause. <laughs> you may think you've got it, but when you're running around that sequence with people you care about, it's very hard to stop action. I encourage people to come up with some sort of mantra that works for them, right? some sort of something that they say to themselves that settles them down. It doesn't have to be magic, it doesn't have to be big. Mine is so unbelievably simple, it's just like, take a minute, Nancy. It's that. Take a minute, Nancy. I also can hear my mom's voice in that, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> that may be part of why it works so well, but take a minute, right? Take a minute, and sometimes it doesn't even need a minute. Jacob referenced this too, and we know that you've heard other people quote Brene Brown, uh, her famous quote of choosing uh, uh, courage over comfort. Um, using skills, the kinds of skills that you've practiced here in small ways, going out and learning more about them so that you can ground yourself, it's really important. Therapy for many years spent a lot of time making its goal having people not feel bad. We've really realized as the fields progressed that that's not really our job because it's a losing battle. Life is hard. 
it hurts. What we need to help people do is learn to tolerate distress, to develop skills and beliefs and feelings about how to stay in it. The perfect example of this is anxiety. If you, anxiety makes us want to run away, right? It makes us want to leave the field. But every time we move out of anxiety, we feel calmer, and so then we continue to stay away from the thing that scares us. And then our lives get smaller and smaller and smaller because we're accommodating our distress, making our goal be to not feel bad. When you learn to tolerate distress, your world gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Over time, you have to figure out what to do with your own stuff. Um, let, me share, let me share something a little bit personal here in the interest of, of being vulnerable. Um, so I grew up in a home with a, a very uh, talented father who also struggled lifelong with anger, right? Bless his soul, rest his soul. He struggled horribly with anger. And so I grew up in a family where anger was dangerous and the consequences of that were quite significant. And so as I enter into my relationships, especially my relationships with men, and those partners show up angry, I completely freeze, shut down, check out, go away. And I could make it their job to not be angry. I could make it their job to make it okay for me by not feeling what is the most normal thing to feel in the context of a relationship, which is, you're driving me nuts. You're driving me nuts right now, right? But if I don't deal with my own stuff, that's gonna be in my relationship all the time. How am I going to show up? How am I gonna be there? How am I going to not make it, in this case, his job to not have anger so that I can have, so that I can be okay, right? Everybody has stuff like that. <laughs> Everybody has stuff like that. And when you're a therapist, you spend 30 years working on it. Um, but you may not need that much time. <laughs> Just me who needs that much time. Okay. So you need to regulate if you want to tolerate. You need to regulate your stuff and you need to regulate um, the, the context, right? So you set yourself up for success. All right. Let me organize my thinking here. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to do three, three rounds of active listening. Okay, and we're going to walk you through the, the different levels of listening. First, the most basic, listening for content, right? Then we're going to have you repeat the exercise, injecting some curiosity. Then we're going to pause. Jacob's going to talk some about empathy. And then we're going to go all the way in. We're going to have you listen to one another using empathy. Now, we don't have enough time to do this as well as I would love to, which is to spend a whole day practicing these skills, so this is a taste. What you're going to do is you're going to pair up with a partner. You're going to choose who will be the speaker and who will be the listener. You're going to have to choose. And the guidelines for the speaker is to choose content that has real significance for you. Something that you currently and or frequently wrestle with. That said, please respect your boundaries. Boundaries are super important and you want to pick something that you is, has enough emotion in it for it to be meaningful, but that respects your privacy. Okay? I want you to speak to the listener in a few statements. Ba 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 ba. Pause. They will paraphrase back to you what they heard. Ba 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 ba. Pause. Right. Keep it short. You stick to one topic. 
You pause so the listener can reflect what they're hearing. And you're gonna do that three times, okay? You're gonna do that three times in each one of these rounds, okay? So the first round is just gonna be a couple of minutes because we're doing the simplest kind of listening, which is paraphrasing, right? Seems easy, isn't always easy, right? So the listener will paraphrase back to the speaker what they heard them say. No edits, no additions, you, no mind reading. You do not need to be a parrot. You can use your own words, but then you have to check it out with them. Did I get it? That's the piece we always forget. Did I get it? You gotta ask, it's not automatic, okay? And then we'll stop and I'll bring you back and then we'll do round two and then we'll stop and then we'll do round three. Go for it. Be the same speaker all along. Uh, I think that's a good idea because we're going to go deeper into the content each time. Okay? So go forth. Now you're going to transition into the next level of listening. You're going to show curiosity. You're, you, you're probably doing it already, I'm not going to lie, but <laughs> you're going to ask questions. You're going to show curiosity. You're going to be interested. You're going to try to learn more and when you show curiosity then the speaker will automatically go deeper right that's how that works so do it again same content right same content i mean you can elaborate certainly i'm not going to try to control you all uh, so the speaker says more about what we're talking about you can either say yeah, more or you can answer. literally say it again you can literally start say it again. Start from the beginning if you want and just go back in it but with more curiosity. Go back into it and now the listener is going to ask questions. It's going to show curiosity in addition to paraphrasing. Okay? As, as, the, as the speaker speaks, the listener... The speaker should pause and create space for the listener to ask thank you for the clarification. I appreciate that. I'm taking too much for granted here. I apologize. So the speaker will speak. You'll pause, you'll reflect back what you heard, and then you'll ask some questions. If it evolves in something to a little bit more natural, that's fine, but remember the skills. If you're in the listener mode, you wanna stay in the listener mode. Okay, go for it. You feel like you'd like to go deeper? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's, let's do that. So here's what we're gonna do. The way to go deeper though is to be intentional about moving into empathy. And so let's have Jacob talk to us a little bit about that before we go for round three, okay? I love talking about empathy and this goes back to my first year in graduate school, had never seen a client, but my mom, is a clinical psychologist and I still somehow got into a PhD program thinking that what therapists did was go into the room and tell people what to do. <laughs> and I was coding some research sessions. So these were real therapy sessions that were sort of marked for research and we were looking for instances of verbatim reflection by the therapist. So the therapist is speaking back exactly the words that the client said and we we're looking at what happened. And so I'm, I'm reading through this, um, through this piece and the client is saying, I'm such a jerk. He didn't use the word jerk, but I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> I'm a jerk, I'm such a jerk. I feel like such a jerk. I'm a jerk, I'm a jerk. I mean, literally, I'm a jerk, I'm a jerk, I'm a jerk. There's finally a pause and the therapist says, you're a jerk. And the client says, you know, but there are some really good things about me too. <laughs> Honest to God. And I, you know, and I, I went to my advisor and was like, what is this? Like, what happened there? And that is empathy in action. When people feel understood, this isn't just about feeling good. When people feel really understood, something else opens up and they go deeper. So let's start by defining empathy. Um, very misunderstood term. Empathy is not sympathy. It's not about sharing the same feeling that someone's having. It is about understanding 
from their frame of reference what feeling that they're having. That's part one. And two, communicating it back to them. So if you are being empathic and you are not doing anything, you're not being empathic. Mm -hmm. Empathy is not just understanding. Definitionally, it is understanding that is communicated back to create a feeling of being understood. So empathic listening involves stepping into the frame of reference of the other and asking yourself, what does this mean to the other person? We've talked about that. It also requires something called validation. This is the client saying, you're a jerk. Or the therapist, rather. Client says, I'm a jerk. Therapist says, you're a jerk. There's no judgment there. The, the therapist isn't actually saying, yes, I agree, you're a jerk. The therapist is saying, I see that you feel like a jerk. That's validation. So if I come to you and I say, I was so nervous about this test, but I got an A and it's all right. And you say to me, well, that's just great, you got an A. That's not validating. Uh, if I say to you, I'm really nervous about getting these medical results back, and you say, you have nothing to worry about. That, that's invalidating. That's the opposite of empathy. That's in your frame of reference telling me what I should or shouldn't be feeling. So the trick here is that even though you may have no idea why the person is feeling that, or you yourself may think it's ridiculous that someone would be nervous about a test that they know they're gonna get an A on because they always get an A on that test. The validating move is to say, you were nervous. I see that you were nervous. So when we talk about empathic listening, we're talking about reflecting back the empathic central core message. What isn't empathic listening? It's not problem solving, it's not focusing on context or extraneous details, and it does not involve judgment. Empathy doesn't care whether you think the person is right or wrong. Empathy is about communicating back that person's understanding. This is really hard because we are naturally incredibly judgmental. We are programmed to be that way. And so a lot of the vulnerability in empathic listening comes in foregoing that judgment, even positive judgment. You might totally understand, I was nervous about that test. Oh my God, I get nervous about tests too. Not empathy. That's positive judgment. That's saying, I, a person distinct from you, think it's great what you're feeling right now. <laughs> Not empathy. Why are we talking about empathy? First and foremost, when it comes to listening, empathy is important because if you want the best information, you get it through empathy. We could, and this isn't romantic, but it is quite literally a means to an end. When people feel understood, they go deeper. So when you empathize with someone, chances are they will go to a place in themselves that will help them solve whatever the problem is that you wanted to jump into problem solving mode for. It also allows the speaker and the listener to feel closer. I share something with you. If you invalidate it, that's it. If you validate it, I feel good, I wanna share something more, deeper. So I share a little something deeper. If you invalidate it, eh, that's it. But if you validate it, then I wanna share something more and deeper. So this is the process whereby we build intimacy. I want you to think of it like a target. And we're trying to hit the bullseye. So at the outer rim is context and extraneous details. Next is the actual content. So facts live here. Below that is the subtext, right? If we could summarize a minute of facts into some sort of more compact message, that would, that would be okay. You can think about the, that orange ring as if someone talks for five minutes and you can say back one or two sentences, this is what you said. Now we're getting closer to the bullseye. If you can summarize back those five minutes in a sentence or two that has at least one emotion word in it, now we've hit real empathy. Now that's the emotional core of the message. So that's what we're shooting for. Let me give you an example. 
So empathy is a target, and in this case, the listener is about to graduate college. She's following in her father's footsteps. She's so excited. He's in business. She has two job offers, one at a startup in San Francisco, the other a much more traditional position in Chicago. Going into the same field as her dad, she comes to him for help, and he's just a bully. He is not listening. He is interrupting her. He's pushing her around. And this feels really different because she was so excited and he's such an empathic guy normally. What's going on here? So she's trying to listen and keep up with what he's saying, right? The college graduate's the listener here. And she could reflect, okay, dad and I are having a conversation about life after college, which is so general that it's basically meaningless. She could reflect back, hey, dad, it really sounds like you want me to take the local job, right? And to which he says, what are you talking about? I'm just giving you an honest opinion about, you know, well, no, I'm, I'm just, no, I don't have an opinion about this. Okay, so she could reflect the subtext, which is that this feels different. This is not the guy who she normally talks to. This is not how he normally behaves. That's good, but it's still in her frame of reference because that's still what this means to her. So instead she realizes, what is dad really saying? He's really saying that this decision is critical to the family. And so she reflects back, dad, I think you're scared that I'm gonna move, take this job at the startup and it's riskier, the startup is gonna fail and I'll fail. And I think that's why you're behaving this way. And dad stops and he says, no, I'm scared you're gonna leave me. When you hit the bullseye, people go deeper. When she's able to reflect back, dad, I think you're scared. She doesn't get it quite right. You don't have to get it perfectly every time. She doesn't get it quite right. But she gets close enough that he can drop down to a level and experience something that was going on for him really strongly, but that he was barely aware of consciously. That's what empathy does. This is not about making people feel good. This is about getting people to think and feel deeper. So we're gonna do this same exercise. Again, same speaker, same topic. Speaker's gonna talk a little bit, then there'll be a pause. And with curiosity, I want you to think about the following questions. What does this feel like to you? What are you feeling when this happens? What does this mean to you? So you're telling me about an event. What's, what's the meaning of it? Why are you choosing to talk about this now? And then if you want to elaborate a little bit, you can ask, when have you felt like that before? When you connect a present moment conversation to something else that felt similar, it often deepens the emotional intensity, which is what we're going for here. So we're gonna take the same amount of time and go back through this, same speaker, same context, but Try these questions in addition to the questions you were using before. See if it feels different. So take about five minutes now and try that. We want to move into our last segment of that wheel that we started with. So Jacob's going to take us there. So we're going to talk about listening to actually build community. Which is why you're here, right? I think listening to form connection is fantastic, <coughs> but there's a bigger payoff beyond that. Um, Google did a landmark study about six or seven years ago where they looked at what made the most effective teams within the organization. And they looked at combining people with different sorts of personalities or leadership styles. And what they ultimately found was none of those things were nearly as impactful as the creation of psychological safety within the team. We create psychological safety through empathic listening. Nancy and I both um, consult with family businesses and family offices, and I know, I'm, I will often say communication isn't the only problem, and communication skills don't fix everything, but unchecked communication problems and bad listening tends to cause a lot of problems. And the solution almost always starts with creating communities that can actually listen to each other. Martin Buber, Jewish theologian, talks about the concept of I and thou. There are I-it relationships, 
So I have an I-it relationship with my barista at Starbucks. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he's a really nice guy, but he matters to me in so far as he serves a role in my life. So I-it isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it means that we're relating role to role. If he gives me the right coffee, he's done his job. If I pay him the money and I'm not rude, I've done my job. It's not a bad thing, but it's surface level. Psychological safety occurs in I-thou relationships where we drop our roles and start relating human to human. This requires, as Nancy said at the beginning, vulnerability and risk not just on the part of the speaker but also on the part of the listener because we are stepping into a foreign frame of reference, letting go of our own judgment, and in doing so, we're taking a risk ourselves. But again, this isn't just about helping people feel nice. When we do that, we get to deeper truths. We get to better information. We actually build stronger teams, like quite literally in workplaces, we build teams that work better when we do this. And at the same time, when we do that, we actually foster growth of the individuals within those teams. So we help people become the best versions of themselves by allowing them, them to strip off the masks that they live in when we're relating just sort of role to role. Nancy, as, as, as you were talking about some of your personal experiences that were, that were sort of echoed within the role play, I was thinking, okay, you talked about where all the bad stuff goes, right? How to deal with all the bad stuff that came up. But I heard a lot of really good stuff come up. And I mean, both, both as a person and, and participating in the role play. And I wonder, where do you think that good stuff winds up going? Like, for example, all the experiences that you have had with bosses or all of your experience launching, like where does that stuff go? Yeah, I think that's tricky because we're not asking people to not bring to bear what it is that they could contribute to a conversation or an experience. We're thinking more about the timing. It's back to that consultant versus management model. The manager is sort of in there making it all happen all the time, the consultant asks for permission to bring it forward. So there would be a right time with my son to share my experiences. But that time isn't when he's looking to me for validation and empathy. So we're not asking people to not bring their strengths to bear. I think that's incredibly important. We're just thinking about timing and pace. So to me, that's the hallmark of I-thou relationships. So when this is happening over and over again over time, we're not just pushing stuff away off into the void. We're creating communities and relationships that tolerate all of that stuff being present. There is one complicated piece to this, which is when we talk about including previously marginalized voices, things often feel worse before they feel better. So if you've got a group of people who believe one thing, who have essentially exiled one voice, and frankly, we probably all know this personally because we do this within ourselves. If most of ourselves feel one way, but part of ourselves feel a different way, we tend to push away the dissonant part. When we invite that part back in, either figuratively within ourselves or literally in the community, there's gonna be more conflict in the short term because now we've got a dominant community of voices and previously marginalized voices that we're listening to. So what we're doing is we're trading some short-term intensity and conflict, which I will say is not a problem. That is, that is a feature of the process. For long-term harmony, where instead of exiling those voices, we now have built a community that can tolerate that difference. Thank you, Jacob. So if we're talking about building community, we're talking about listening to other people, and then very often it lands at this question, I didn't like how they said that to me. <laughs> they didn't say it to me right, so I don't think I have to listen to them. I've been on that side of that feeling quite a few times myself, I'm not gonna lie. There's no denying that a poorly sent message is harder to take in. And you don't have to tolerate abuse, certainly. 
That's not what we're setting up here. You don't have to tolerate abuse. And you can ask for a timeout if there's a poorly sent message. You can ask for a timeout on yourself. You can't ask for a timeout on somebody else. You can say, even if they're the one that's losing it, you can say, I need to take a moment. Trust me that interpersonally, it works better. Nobody likes, uh, nobody, not adult or children, but especially adults don't like to say, you need a time out. <laughs> <laughs> that, that rarely, rarely goes well. <laughs> Also, colloquially, we use this word flooded, right, to say, oh, I'm flooded. Well, flooded is a real thing. If someone has spoken to you in a way that you can no longer stay tuned in, you're not going to be thinking clearly. Your heart rate's going to be up, your blood pressure's going to go up. Whatever comes next isn't going to go well, <coughs> right? So if you wisely take a time out on yourself and take a moment, do the pause thing, step away, it's also your responsibility to say when you're coming back. The biggest problem with people taking a time out is that the person on the other side doesn't know if they're ever going to get back to this. And so then what do they do? They pursue. Mm -hmm. They chase, 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 because the need is real, because the feeling is legitimate. But you can establish in your relationships that sometimes I get flooded and I'm going to need to take a break on me. I'll come back. So you're like, I got to take a time out. We'll talk about this at dinner. Or let's try it tomorrow morning. Or honest to God, right now I'm so flooded, I don't know when I can do this, but I'm going to do this. Okay? Telling somebody you're going to come back and not dismiss them changes the meaning of the timeout. Also, no. The truth lies in contradictions, right? The truth lies in contradictions. The coin is whole, both sides are saying something true. You don't get to tune out a message that wasn't sent in the package that you expect. That somebody's not using your language, or your words, or your tone, or how you culturally show up, right? You don't get to reject their message because it didn't come with the right package. In fact, Demanding a certain form of delivery is often how people with more power and more privilege dismiss people with less power and less privilege. They don't listen to the content, they react to the delivery, and they say, I'm out now. I don't have to, del I don't have to pay attention to you. It also protects us from getting it that the rage, that the hurt, that the confusion, that the sense of injustice, pick any of the above, are legitimate. And when it feels that bad, it doesn't often come out pretty. So yes and no. You don't have to tolerate abuse. You can step back on yourself and come back, but no. You don't get to decide that if somebody doesn't send the message in the package you want, that you don't have to pay attention. This is a heavy thing to say um, at the very end of a presentation, a very, very heavy thing to say. And one of the reasons that we decided to put this at the end is because I've read the book, and I know the presenter that you're going to have next, right? And how great that you're going to be talking about um, race and about privilege, right? And how incredibly important that is and how much we admire that and how much this becomes essential to move into that. To be able to hear things that are hard to hear and take them in. You'll get that in a nice, lovely book from a tremendous author 
but you're not always going to get that from folks in your community that aren't necessarily going to deliver it in the same way. So if you want to show up as the listener, you need the pause. You need to look for the feelings underneath the words. And you have to manage your own stuff. And this is also part of our own stuff. Right? Privilege, power, that's also as much a part of our own stuff as the family of origin stuff that I referenced earlier. Right? That's as much as part of our own stuff. Like I said, a very heavy place to end, um, but such an important topic couldn't be left without that. Remember that listening has the three parts at least, and they're all connected. And we want to thank you so much for inviting us into your truly remarkable, soulful process. Uh, we were honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Let me ask you to take three deep breaths. Ready? First one. Another, please. And one more. Now let me ask you this. What's something you heard tonight that you want to take with you? Write it down. What's something you heard in the presentation tonight that you want to take with you? This might be refrigerator worthy. <laughs> something you want to take with you. Write it where you'll find it, where you know where it is. Just one, just one. For how many of us is that one thing you just wrote making you feel a little queasy? <laughs> Raise your hands. Don't be shy, don't be shamed. Mine is, mine is if I don't like the package, I still have to listen. <laughs> See, they give me 20 minutes on Sunday and nobody can talk back. <laughs> I like that arrangement. I don't want to be on the other side of that. But it's okay to feel queasy, because you know what? What's turning inside us now is part of that noticing and part of that transformation. <coughs> I'm serious about the one thing you wrote down, whether it made you feel queasy or not. Because friends, this is real. Do you know the next time we meet, we will be in the actual presidential election year? Somebody said, ooh. <laughs> that made you queasy? <laughs> but do you see the connection, not only in the courageous conversations we are trying to have in our families and in our places of work and our places of, of faith and our other communal settings, we are going to need these things for our nation. And so the practice and remembering, writing down what you want to remember so that you can, I can, we can begin to practice. We've said it each time we've gathered, this is an arc. And I'm thinking tonight that's not right. It's a roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> but a roller coaster has a beginning and an end. We are grateful that each time we gather, there are a hundred souls in this room. That means there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people who are being affected by this. That you have taken it seriously, that you're willing to feel queasy. We are grateful. Come back. The journey's not over. Come back with your toolkit packed with all you've learned. 
And this one thing you've written down tonight, may it be your practice, our practice, between now and when we gather again, to get stronger, to get better, feel a little less queasy. Join me in thanking Nancy and Jacob for tonight. <laughs>